if uh, w- w- one of the things that I strive for is once if I come to a particular tutorial that you you as well enjoy it and I enjoy it myself because if you don't enjoy it um, I really enjoy learning and I think now I'm starting to enjoy teaching so I really want you to enjoy learning and I found that if you enjoy learning and if you have a fun teacher to interact with then it's easier for you to understand and grasp what is being taught so yeah um, feel free to make a joke <laughs> and yeah or something just enjoy yourself I hope you enjoy yourself yeah, so with that, uh, let me start. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so um, the different methods of doing time series analysis. I mean, we you covered using profit um, with Yabi on, on Monday. And we have the ARIMA models. And th- these are typical machine learning. Uh, like machine learning models and machine learning algorithms, but we have deep learning where it sort of it it was a craze or it was one of the one of the best things to hit the market like a while back. And I, I, I remember yeah being excited because it's crazy that uh, you can just feed images to a machine and it can be able to sort of understand what that particular image is. And yeah, so with that, let's just start with this. So we use a particular sort of um, okay. Let me let me show you the challenge document here. Uh, so with with deep learning, um, we have different types of architectures. We have architectures that are specific for or are tailored to be good at one thing, and others are tailored for the others. So we have I don't know if you've heard about convolution neural networks. We have recurrent neural networks, and we have GANs. Uh, GANs are general adversarial networks. These are the ones that create things out of scratch. They sort of learn uh, information about their data, and then they can sort of come up with a new thing. These are the ones that you see um, sort of creating new art, uh, creating new faces, and all that. They sort of learn the the properties of what is a face based on their data, and they build up on that. We have reinforcement learning. Reinfor- reinforcement learning is the one that is used in mainly uh, games where you have an agent and you punish the agent or reward the agent based on something that he did. If he didn't if he did something that you don't like, you punish it. And if you did it did something that you like, you basically reward it. And then since you've given it a reward, then it knows um this is the way to go forward. This is what I have to do to keep on getting the reward. And we can we have convolution neural networks and convolution co- convolution convolutional neural networks are the ones that are really good for image identification, image classification, and object detection. Uh, sort of the ones that involve cameras. I think driving cars are the ones that really use convolution neural, neural networks. And we have recurrent neural networks. Now, recurrent neural networks are the best for for speech data and NLP, that is natural language processing, where we have sort of a sequence and you have to learn, you cannot understand what this particular word means without the thing that comes before it. Like you cannot, under, for example, this sentence, deep learning techniques, I used to predict various outcomes, right? If, if you give the learning model outcomes, it doesn't really know what in the whole sentence, where the meaning of the sentence um, depends on the values that ca- that came before it, like um, deep learning techniques. So predict sort of uh, relies on this particular deep learning technique, because we all know what those are. And those are what the current neural network does. And basically data that has a se- se- sequential data in a way. And with that, they have a particular problem uh, called vanishing gradients, uh, but that's going a little bit into the details. Uh, so the thing that you're going to use today here is called the LSTM, but we, we have we have two different types of uh, two categories that fall under recurrent networks. We have long-term, short-term memory, and oh, the other one was called, oh Jesus, don't tell me I've forgotten the name. I know the name, um, GRU, yeah, yeah, gated. I can't remember the definition, let's see, uh, GRU forgotten uh yeah so this is also yeah yeah okay no no not that one i don't know oh yeah yeah uh gated 
the case they solve the problem that I, I told you called the vanishing bridge. And just, uh, that, that's 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 going to get a little bit into the details, and that's going to be beyond the scope of this particular tutorial. So just know the one that the one that you're going to use today is called the long short term memory, and this uh, solves a problem called vanishing gradients that is usually in the recurrent neural networks. And the advantage of this is it sort of gives the model attention. Um, attention in this particular sense is that. It, it specifies and gives it sort of, um, hmm, what's the term that I'm looking for? And it gives it like an idea and be able to hold the context of a particular word and the context of, in case you're using NLP, and the context of a particular item. So if you had this particular sentence, uh, yeah, predict now it's going to use uh, the weight of all these other words before it and be able to come with and understand what you're trying to do. Uh, so we're going to use an LCM for this because we're going to solve this particular problem as a time, anal a time analysis problem. And okay, let me start with this. Am I, is it mounted already? I don't think so. So let me just mount this and, okay, it's not even initialized. Okay, connected and this should be running, all right. Excuse me. Uh, go. All right, so successful, and then we see to the directory where we have the code. Yeah, and then we import the library. So there are different libraries that sort of handle the deep learning aspect for us. Um, we have TensorFlow, I don't know if you're familiar with it, and we have PyTorch. And the difference are that is PyTorch sort of gives you a little bit more control on how your model looks like or what parameters your model is going to take. Uh, but TensorFlow is enough because they, they basically do the same thing. If you want a deeper control over your model and you want to specify certain things, you use PyTorch over TensorFlow. But for this particular reason here, even most people in the industries use PyTorch. Uh, but yeah, TensorFlow is good enough to form an understanding and sort of the intuition behind what the planning models are. So this is sort of like a same library as you have a Scalan and it caters the machine learning bit for us. And we're going to use one particular data. The data that we have is, oh, I think, let me, let me, let me share, let me share this with, um, with you guys so that you can go through the, the, the what's it called, the notebook as well. So, yeah, yeah. And then, this is week three, okay. Um, so, can I open this in a new tab? Okay, no, apparently not. So let me just copy this. And so probably has been edited. All right. Okay. Sales production and Mm Um, make a copy. And so with this, 
I'll just move to and then three. Here we go, and then move here. Okay, just move. All right, so I'm sure you yeah you can download the data from this particular link. Um, you'll get it there. And this is just a data with uh, data. And the first thing that we do is normalize it using or scale it using the mean max scalar, where you know what it does, the highest value. In, in this particular column, the sales column is assigned as a one and the lowest is assigned as a zero. And they are scaled in that particular respect. Um, and we then go to de describe the data that we have. We can do the house or describe uh, to get the description. And we can see that um, there, we can see that the characteristics are sort of uh, borrow over. Well, okay, apart from this, it's just a, these are just the values. So we can see that the mean, which is 270, has been assigned zero, and the maximum, which is 1389, has been assigned a one. That's just what scaling does. And in this particular section of the code, we are going to plot the values and see how the trend is and how the data changes with time. And we can do both uh, for the data that has not been scaled um, that is the X label is the date and the Y label you can see we have houses sales here that is a sales column that that is not scaled and it has a color blue and we have the scaled column on this other side which has a color green and you can see that the data sort of um, the the properties of the data carry on you can see that we have this particular sky um, I mean we have this dip in in our particular sales around 2008 2009 um, and if you remember correctly, this was a place where we had the financial crisis of 2008, where the house, the prices of the house plummeted. And you can see that this data sort of reflects that. You can also tell, like, um, also we had a dip in 1966. I don't know if anyone was born, any, any of us was born then, but so there was also sort, some sort of dip. So it sort of gives us intuition of what the data, of what our data is telling us and the dips throughout the, the time period um yeah so and we can do a histogram or we sort of tell um what what or rather the distribution of the prices for the house um we can also see that for both the scaled and the data that is not scaled they have the same properties and they are skewed to the left yeah and you can fix a skew if you want uh, that, that's just yeah that's just analysis but you really don't have to so the next section that we go to is um doing analysis for the unit root test uh so for you this is the section where let's go back here and okay this is here check whether your time series data is stationary um what stationary means is that there's a trend or your data has trend where we see um the, the values are sort of not stagnant and they sort of increase over time or decrease over time and the way we do this is using uh something called uh, the add filler test. This is a function in the stats model. And what this does is sort of uh, calculates and does um, calculates the, okay, it calculates multiple things, but we have, we have calculates the p-value of, of the null hypothesis, whether, that, whether our data has unit root. What unit root means uh, is basically whether it has uh, stationarity or it doesn't whether there's a trend toward our data where there's an upward trends or a downward trends. So using this particular function, we can be able to determine that. And we can see that since our p-value is 0 0.057, which is basically 0 point, which is 6%, we can reject the null hypothesis that our data set or our series here, our column has unit root. Uh, and unit root, the thing, that, the definition of unit root is that it, it is a property that random, 
it's a property that random columns and random data has or random events generate. So if this was below, I mean, you did A-B testing last week, and if this was 0 0.5, we can reject uh, the null hypothesis. And we say that our data, our data has stationarity. So depending on this particular value that we have here, this is whether this is going to determine, the p-value is going to determine whether your data has stationarity or it doesn't. And in case your data has stationarity, we have something called, we, we remove stationarity in a certain way. And the way we do this is by differencing, by differencing the data. So that is the, the observation from the previous time step. Let's say, for example, okay, yeah. Let's say uh, this was house sales, so house, house sales scaled. If we added another column, okay, I'm not even running this. So <laughs> let me just run all of this. So we have that, that. Oh, Panda's not imported, okay. <laughs> uh, so we have that. And describe loss. And then this. All right. See, uh, this is the plot. Is it taking it? It's about the difference, um, sort of the difference function over there, and you have the interval. So you can difference it in whatever intervals you want. You can say minus two, minus three, and that sort of remove the stationarity. If your data set has um, some sort of stationarity, this is how you remove it. So if you come here, you see how sales difference. And if we do house, okay, house sales scaled, okay. Also, let's just do households dot. All right. So so what this particularly does, it sort of takes um this particular value and it's my minus is the one that it had before. So here you, you see we have negative 0 0.0 that is value, the one that is on the third, on the third month of 1996, and subtract the value that came before it. So on February, and you see we get that particular value over here. So that's how you basically solve for stationarity in your data set. And the next section is going to come to the auto auto correlation autocorrelations and the partial correlations. Now, I'm sure you all have done a confusion matrix before, where you're getting for the correlation of the data in a particular column and how it relates to data in another column. So for a time series data that we have, like we have here, where we have the date column and the value that you want, yeah, we do an autocorrelation and a partial plot. And these are also done or are achieved in the stats.model model um, library. And what this is going to do is sort of going to calculate the correlation between today's, let's say, let's just do the same example that we had here. Um, it's going to calculate the correlation of this particular, let's just use the same two, two examples here, of the match value, which is 0 0.171, rounding off. And it's going to calculate the correlation of this particular value with the correlation of the month that came before it, like so. And we can plot it and we can see sort of the, the correlation sort of goes down. It can also tell, oh, okay. It, it can also tell, but we, we've limited it. We've limited the lags to like 40. So it's only going to show us 40 values, right? And we can see that the correlation, there is a trend. If, if we plotted for the whole data, you'd see, uh, but our data, our data set is small. But if, if you plotted for the whole data, let me show you a sort of a plot. That sort of applies, yeah. If you had really value, really large values, you'd see something of this, where our data sort of have has a certain trend that it goes down and it goes up, it goes down and it goes up, and from that you can be able to incur what type of generation your model was done, and how your particular data was generated. And this particular article here um, has that particular understanding. I've linked it um, on the on the on the challenge document. It's down here. So yeah, here, yeah, autocorrelation. And if you want to build more intu intuition about what correlation means and partial correlation 
is, you can go through that and it's going to give you a deeper intuition about this particular thing. Uh, so with the partial autocorrelation is a summary, oh, uh, that's, that's the autocorrelation. So this tells us uh, it's a summary of this particular value and the value that came before it. And we have the partial autocorrelation. For the autocorrelation, now sort of removes the values that have a strong correlation, where if, if yesterday's value sort of influenced today's value, we take away that particular value from our data set and we do another correlation of the whole particular data set. And we can see that it's really, yeah, it, we, we only have this particular spike here in the beginning. And then after that, it sort of goes down and it, it, we don't have really that much correlation. And this also is going to give you an insight of what particular method was used to generate the data and describe some of the characteristics that our data have, has, I mean, so after after doing that, it's just information that uh, you just build the intuition of what the data is, and you can know what or what particular um, even deep learning model to to sort of employ. And now we get to the best part. Um, we have to separate the data into a training and validation set. And if if you've done any machine learning model before, you know that we have to have okay. If it's not unsupervised learning we have to have a target column. I mean, that's the Y column, and we have to have the, the features. I don't know if there's any question. Maybe today I'm going a bit fast. If I am, tell me, and if you have a question, of course, feel free to ask the question. Mm -hmm. Here we are. And we get to the, to, to the best part, the modeling part. So uh, we have to get the length and the window size. This is just um, choosing variables that you're going to use for a particular model. So for the win window size, this is a period of two years. This can be any values you decide. This is sort of the parameter tuning. How long do you want your window to be like? And I'm going to show you how we use that particular window. And we have the batch size. So you can specify the batch size to be anything that you want or in any way that you want. Here, we use the batch size here to sort of define um, where we want. Instead of using the train test split, we use the batch size to de, to you to determine what how how large our training column and how large our training test set is going to be and how much our tra our, our validation or our test set is going to be based on the particular window size you can see here where we have um, okay you can see we defined the date train okay that's that's for later this this is just um splitting the date column and have and storing those values in these particular variables. And then we have the X train. This, this is what we're most interested in. We can see we have the houses and we have our scaled column, right? And the values, and then we set it up to a certain size. That is now the size of our training set. And we are going to use this and you're going to cast it as type float uh, just for easation of calculation when this particular data goes into a model. Am I running them again? Okay, no, I'm not. Um, so let me just run them. Do you... yeah. So the plot comes through, that comes through. Here we go. Then we do the top and this. So you can see, oh, I didn't do the shape before, uh, but it's okay. <laughs> you can guess that 27 rows. Uh, so you can see that we've uh, separated them into a particular way where we have 601 the rows in the training set and we have 96 in the validation of the test set it doesn't really matter what you call them and we come to the next section of uh of now defining the model you see that uh, tensorflow itself has and um, we we set the seed what the seed does is in this code we are always going to get the same values because the, the the randomness usually changes, especially when you're doing something random with the data. And setting this particular seed will ensure no matter how many times you run the code, uh, you're always going to get the same result. And we start with the first uh, TensorFlow function called expandDIMS. Now, what expandDIMS does is, let's say you have a data, uh, you have a data set. For example, the one that you have here, you see this particular data set that you have here has one particular uh, one particular, what do I call it? One particular axis or what's the number that I use? One particular dimension, it's a 1D data, meaning the data is just sort of like a list. 
but we want to manipulate or we want to change the shape of how our data looks like. And what expand beam does, it just adds an extra dimension to the data. And we can see here, our data has changed. Instead of being one particular, just instead of being one particular dimension, we now have two dimension. We have one dimension that is 601 and we have another one. This is, let's say the X and Y dimension. So we have another dimension. And this particular dimension, this doesn't necessarily have to have any value. It just adds an extra dimension um, to that particular data. Okay, I think I've had a question. Okay. Um, so, Milky, you can unmute yourself. Uh, I was wondering why we first uh, changed the dimension and again changed it back again. Um, did we really change the dimension? No, we didn't change the dimension. We just sell all here, here, reshape. No, oh, this is a date column. So we, we aren't doing anything with the, with the train column. This is just a train column. You can just ignore this. Yeah, but for, and okay. Now the way we change it here, this sort of did the same thing for us here, for the expand dims. So you can also use reshape if you want. But the, the specific reason why I used expand dims here is we want the data itself to become a tensor. Um, tensor are sort of the, the, the values that uh, TensorFlow understands. This is, just think of it as a NumPy array where tensors usually go with multiple dimensions and if they go higher where you can have it's just sort of like a 3D mapping. That's what tensors. That's what tensors mean. And for the expand beams, we wanted to turn it into a tensor that has one extra dimension. Okay. I've answered your question. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. No problem. So yeah, we have the tensor here, and now it has additional dimension. And we have another function. Uh, this is some of the easiest way to create a data set. Uh, using data dot data set from tensor from tensor slices. Now, what this does is it's going to go through. Oh, there's an example I had. Okay, yeah, here we go. Uh, so we have tf dot range. If we print this, have I run the others even? Okay, I've run that one. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that shape changes, and we have from tensor. You see, this sort of uh, creates uh, 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 creates values from zero to ten, and this is a fast section. And what from tensor means is you sort of load each particular variable or each particular item one by one, convert everything there into a dimension, or rather, every single value in your particular NumPy array or in your particular list to a tensor one by one where instead of having a data set that has, okay, using this from TF, 10, zero to 10, zero, another tensor that is one, and another tensor that is two. And after that, you're going to, okay, so we convert that and we get this tensor slice data set that has this particular shape, one and zero, right? And is a float 32. Uh, and after, after creating that particular tensors from the slices here, we get, we use another function still from TensorFlow called window. Now the beauty of window is you specify a particular window or a particular section that you want to break your list or your NumPy array into. So in here we have window and the limit is five. So you see now we have one window that has five characters or has five variables, which is zero, one, two, three, right? Those are five. And then now that is one data set. Go to the next one, move one particular shift by one. Yeah. All right, shift by one. And if we shift by one, we get now the next data set tensor starts at one, goes to two, goes to three, up to five, and so on and so forth until you've gone through the whole data set. And if there's a reminder, just drop it. If we have, let's say, the last one ran from one particular point to another. I mean, if you see now from here, we, we've covered all of them when we get to five, six, nine. And if we start by six, so let's say six and then seven and then eight and then 10, it, it won't be a complete one, it won't be five. And if you get any case like that, just drop that. And so this is going to be the end of the tensor that we have. So that this is what we do here. And you remember the window size that we specified before. So this is going to go 
um, the window size was 48, which means that's two years. So two years plus one. It's going to come and take the data in like two years and then plus one and then shift to the next one. So this data is going to be loaded in this particular sense. I hope that makes sense, right? Are we? Okay, so if it makes sense, let me continue. And this is called flat. Um, this is also a function of what flat does is if, if you are doing this particular window in here, and okay, this is a batch. So we get the window and we sort of window batch here and get that particular that particular data set that looks in this particular sense. And if you didn't have the flat here, it's going to, re instead of reading them, you see here we have like a different array. We have one array here and we have another array here. And in instead of reading the data like this, it would have just joined everything if we use the description here. Uh, the window method returns, okay, blah, 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 where something we have these tenses like this. This is the data set that you have before. I think that that doesn't copy well. Here, yeah. this is the data set that you have created before here. Yeah. Like this is what we have here. And instead of returning it like this, it would have returned, if we didn't use the flat map, flat, flat map method, it would have returned it like this. But once we use the flat plus, uh, it takes in the data as we want it. And that's why we use this particular function here. And now the map in here, now this particular function or this particular function, the map function is going to now create our variables that we have. Now that these are the features for our model and the, what's it called? Uh, the target column. You see for our data here, um, for the window size, we specified 48 plus one, right? Now, in this case, so um, if if this was a particular data set that we had, um, I think, yeah, just because it's smaller, it's going to give us an intuition of what we have. So what this means is uh, come into this particular array that we have here um, from zero, one, two, three to four, and then take the first values, except the last one. Yeah, I'm sure this is, you're all familiar with this. Uh, this is list indexing, where I take all values except the last one, so take zero, one, two, three, if this was our data, and then map that to the last value that we have. In this case, which is our, our features, which will be zero, one, two, three. And then our four here, will be the column that you're going to predict with. And in that we have our own, what's it called? We have our own Y column and our we've changed that has catered for this particular section, was it? Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Um, transform the time series data into supervised learning data, where we have the X, the features, and the target Y column. So that, that's how we achieve that particular task. And with that now, we say batch. this is a batch size that we had to say prefetch. This just means reload that particular um, and now we just put all of that into a function. I just broke in the, I broke it down one by one so that you can understand what the particular function does. So you just keep on running them, keep on running them. All right, all right. The batch size, the window one. Uh, so here uh, we sort of yeah, pass the X string that you had before into that and now that is going to go through the transformation and the encoding that I've showed you before. And the encoding process is also a huge part of, of deep planning. If we didn't have this whole particular process where we encode in a particular way, then we wouldn't have a deep planning project. That also matters. And so we do windowed and yeah, now we have our data set, our data set stored right here, our training data, our validation data stored here. Uh, so you know, <laughs> this is some of the best parts, or rather, <laughs> um, this is what got me to be the beginning with. I was just excited about this. So the thing about TensorFlow, it, it does things for us. It makes it easier for us. So we have, we first defined a sequential model. Here we go. So, Almost every single model that you're going to build using TensorFlow 
um, it's going to it's going to be a sequential model. A, secu a sequential model means there is some sort of series and there is some sort of progression through the whole data, and we define the first layer. What is it? We define the the first layer. So we have LSTM, and I think there's a question. Okay. Oh, 48 is equal to two years because of the month. Twelve times two, right? No, no. Oh, I'm wrong. Yeah, it's it's four years. Yeah, it's four years. My bad. My bad. Sorry, it's four years. So yeah, it's four. It's a window of four years. I, I can't do math. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's four years. Uh, and now we have the first the first LSTM here. Um, this is how you define, we define the model as a sequential model from the TensorFlow library, and then we added the particular LSTM. So if it was an RNN, you'd sort of uh, model add, model dot add, and then RNN, and then the variables, or rather the, like so, uh, but after you've imported it, that's how basically, that, that's how it's easy to use TensorFlow uh, with, with respect to PyTorch, because PyTorch is a bit more complicated and a bit more complex. All right, here we go. And uh, now we sort of de determine the neurons. Uh, let me show you a picture of a deep learning model, right? I, I don't know if you guys have an understanding of what neurons are. Are deep learning, them sort of look. Let's see if this is going to open up big enough. Okay, and there we go. But it's so unclear. Okay, there we go. Uh, so this is the input layer. So for a model, for you to have a deep learning model, it's basically structured. The, the, the insides and what goes on a neuron is what changes. There are different computations and different functions that go on inside a neuron. But a layer is made up of particular neurons. And so for us, we have the input layer. The input layer for us is the first LSTM here. And it has eight neurons. And you can see dead something. Okay. And you can see that we have the eight neurons and we have the input shape. Now the input shape is in CAD. This has to be the same with what you have in your data set. So you will probably have to define the shape that you have here and then put that as an input shape here. And you have the return sequences. Return sequences just means um, it feeds off each other, every value. Ah, now the beauty of LSTM, you see, what is this? You see how we have this, where we have a hidden layer one and we have this particular neurons and this particular neurons. I hope it's clear now. If it isn't, uh, tell me in the chat. Yeah, so we have this particular neuron. This is what we mean by a neuron. We see it, it only goes forward like that. Like, yeah, they, they don't really interact with each other. But for the LSTM with return sequences means that these particular neurons can share information between the two. Where this one, if there's a value here, it can be passed to this one and it can pass to this one. It can be passed to this one. And all of these values here will sort of give and will determine what particular input this particular neuron does. Uh, it leans heavy on the math. Uh, so I'm just giving you a sort of overview because yeah, we, we, we have other terms like back propagation and all that that um, will, be, will be too complex and will be challenging. I wouldn't say complex in a way, but it's going to make people who haven't done anything to do with deep learning before sort of afraid and scared. So I'm just going to give you the overview and you, you, you get that. So basically what this means is one particular layer here. This layer one is an L step so neurons feed of each other and there are eight of them. Here we go. Yeah, eight of them. LSTM model, uh, I mean another LSTM layer, which has four neurons and it still takes input from the one that you had before. So the input is going to sort of remain the same. And we have the dense. Now the dense here is the last layer and uh, so this is a multi-classification problem. I don't know if there's one that doesn't have that. Okay, yeah, this one, this one sort of works, right? So th this is a different architecture where, it architecture where it has an input layer that has four neurons and then four neurons and then 
I think these are five, six, nah, I'm not counting. But now the dense layer is this final layer that sort of condenses all of these outputs, this data with this particular shape. And it pushes them and forces them into one particular neuron where the output of this particular um, architecture and this particular neural network is going to be one particular value. And that's what we mean when we say dense equals one. And just just like the just like the machine learning models and the machine okay I don't think they do but we have something called as a loss function I think you've encountered it before uh, a loss function basically how how deep learning models work is let's say you, you, they're usually an equation and the equation is usually a w mm -hmm, weights x plus b where I think you all can see this where these are the weights, the weights, the W is what the model learns. I've had a question. Anyway, cool, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so my, Michael, you can ask your question. Oh, please, please. It's all right. I think I've sent, I've sent it in the message. Oh, okay, okay. Um, you, were, you were pointing to something, but I couldn't see. Oh, okay. So I'm not really sure whether I'm visible here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Milky asked about why none. Ah, uh, yes. You remember, uh, you remember how we sort of defined, was it? Here. Yeah. How we sort of ex. Uh, ex expanded our dimensions to 601 and 1. Now what this means is once we come here and sort of add the uh, our particular our particular really has no particular value and it's sort of empty and if you do remember where was it I think it changed it did it did change somewhere yeah here you can see it changes shape we have zero, one, and we have none on the other side. So that, that, that's why we have included none here in the input shape. Okay, um, is that clear enough? Milky? Okay, cool. Mm, so here we go. Are we? Oh, yeah, I was sort of explaining the loss function, what a loss function is. So basically think of any machine learning model or the, the, the process that goes in in one particular neuron as this particular function here. Um, and this is going to give us a particular value. Let's say y, y hat, this is a predicted value. So I hope you all can see this. I don't know if I have to write somewhere where can't be large enough, but if it's not, you guys will let me know. So we have this. This is basically what is happening inside a neuron. And this particular function changes um, depending on the particular model we have, but this is sort of the oversimplification of it. This is a bias, and these are the weights, and X are the features that we have equals to a Y hat. Now, a loss function is a supervised learning where we have the true Y, right? So Y, minus y hat is equals to a certain value, right? Um, let's say, I don't know what you're going to call it. Let's say difference, right? Let's say diff, diff like that. This is a difference. Now, the loss function help us minimizes this particular difference. So it's sort of a function that applies and modifies our w here that this particular equation that we have y minus y hat the error that you have between the two is reduced i think that makes sense if it doesn't make sense ask a question if we have multiple inputs yes yes we can this is really like so exactly um and let me come back here let me just reiterate on this we have a particular function that gives us the pro the prediction if you've done any mathematical course, you know what a function is. A function is basically a mapping like this, where in our particular function, we have this particular W. And you remember I mentioned something called back, back propagation, and that comes into play here. But we have our weights, X plus B. 
And when you're training a model, what we really, what we really learn and the model learns is W. Yes, and that is going to give us a prediction called Y hat. And for the loss function now, if we take the actual Y that we have in our data, minus Y hat and get a difference. So we are going to try using the loss function here and minimize this particular difference that we have. And using that term called back propagation, we are going to come and update W. So that's why the loss function is really important and it must be there in any machine learning model or in any deep learning model. LSTM use them, recurrent neural network use them, convolution neural, excuse me, and convolution neural networks use them. So I'm sure you, I, I think that's a good overlay of what a loss function is. So that's the loss function here. And now we have something else called an optimizer. And we use an Adam, uh, Adams optimizer. So for the Adams optimizer is the one that sort of updates the bias, is it? Yeah. No, no, I'm wrong. I, I really don't want to tell you the wrong thing. So optimizer. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't tell it. Oh, without getting it, uh -huh. hold what uh, is shape and mold your model into the most accurate possible by fatting. Ah, oh, yes, yes. Ah, oh, yeah, I remember now. Um, the the optimizer doesn't update the bias, but it's going to be used to update the weights. Um, this is sort of uh, does some normalization and scaling based on the weights that you have, so that your weights don't go, don't get outrageously big and don't get outrageously small. So that's what the Adam optimizer, and there are various optimizers. We have the stochastic, I think, optimizer, but generally for every learning model and any deep learning model that you use, it's recommended that you use the, optimize, the Adam's optimizer. But depending on your problem, the optimizer must might change. And yeah, and the influence the learning of your model. So various optimizers and Adam's is the best one that we all right and we can sort of defend the model here right yeah and we have the Huber loss is chosen because it's quite robust for non-linear regression models and models with none okay that's just an, like, why we were using the Hubble instead of the others um, we can use even MAE that's a good loss function yeah, uh, and binary cross entropy for a classification problem, depending on the model that you have. And now we have this particular function called model.summary. Um, this is a sequential one here, and it sort of gives us the, the summary and the parameters that are trainable in our particular model. We can see in our LSTM here that has the none, none, eight, this particular eight is because of the number of neurons that we have. So the output, the output of this particular LSTM and this particular layer is going to be none, none, and then the final, the final value is going to have, um, it's going to be eight, eight particular values because of the, I mean, eight particular values, yeah, because of the neurons and the layers that we have here. And you can see the LCM also the same applies where we have none, one, and the four, here. Yeah. And it has 208 um, trainable parameters. And now for the dense layer, we see none because it's it's basically a one DRA and the one here, which is the final value that you want. And you can see the trainable parameters and the non-trainable parameters. That depends on if you added any fancy things into your model. And there's some parameters, let's say, uh, but uh, okay, let, let, me not, let, let me not mention about the trainable and non-trainable parameters. It's usually in the CNN and the GANS model where we have, we are chopping off something, but that, that's something else. So don't worry about that. And then now we feed the model. It's just as we define the function and we added them. So we model and that's how we train it. You do model.fit as we did before, we add the data set and then the epochs. The epochs means how many times, how many times do we want to run uh, our particular model or yeah, how many times do we want to go through the particular data as a model is learning? And for every run, 
here we have we have the deep, the deep neural network yeah so for origin destination blah 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 we have that particular data and if the data goes from here a all the way to here price at the end that's one particular epoch and you remember as i was explaining the wx here where back so back propagation things that whatever the model has learned and the new models that the weight has here at the end we sort of bring them uh, get them from at the end here and bring them to the beginning here and then using those particular model go through the whole process again and do that 200 times basically that's how we train the model so it's going to run through this particular network once and that's one epoch here and you see uh, the beauty of it is we have the validation data and you have the test uh, the training data and the beauty about our uh, tensorflow is it does the evaluation for us so we can see that the law sort of decreases as we go through meaning our model is generalizing and it's fitting the data that we have so that's it here we go and now this is a plot just showing how our our loss is you see the loss here this shows the loss of basically learning where you can see the loss here this is the error that we had so think of uh, let me go here right control z right so the loss here is this particular difference so we can see that this difference goes down as we train through the epochs as we go yeah sort of tends towards zero and you can see that the evaluation loss also tends towards zero that means we're sort of improving and we sort of have uh, a, a place where the model sort of at uh, the learning rate sort of cuts off from 50 going onwards and it sort of stagnates here as you go forward so that means at, at, at some particular point um, our model really isn't improving or if it's improving it's barely improving but basically that's the trend that we have goes down as we decrease the number of epochs and be very careful when you choose these particular epochs because um and depending on your data this com this process is really computationally expensive and it's going to take a while um we have models that run for days and others run 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 for months like for months i mean if you've heard about a uh, gpt3 uh, that's like one of the best models that has, was it a billion parameters or something? Uh, I think that model ran for over months, where it just monthly, you're just training one particular model to see the output that we have. So we have the value loss and the loss. You can see how the trend goes as you go down. And then we can do the validation. Uh, this is sort of um, using the validation set and basically testing the, sec the accuracy of the model that you've just trained over here um did i train it really okay um so let's do that and then okay lstm that and we can train it a whole so uh but we are we are running on collab so the first i think yeah the first epoch takes a minute and so five seconds and the rest you see that our data is small and our neural network is in that deep uh, so for your project here, yeah, I'd advise you to sort of play around with this. Um, I don't want you giving me the same model that I have here. Um, yeah, just play around, try using different neurons and try using, yeah, you can have one particular layer. Just play around with it. What building a model entails. Okay, Milky. I had a question mm -hmm. about uh, creating the model. Uh, when you when you are specifying the ad, uh, when we are calling the ad method, are we creating neurons with the uh, with the uh, with that number of uh, yeah. inputs? I, I didn't really get it. What do you mean? Or do you mean yeah. here at the at the eight? Yeah. Like uh, based on the diagram. Uh, based on the diagram mm -hmm. you gave us, uh, we, ha we are supposed to have uh, input and output yeah. at uh, the ends, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we are creating the middle part uh, when yes. we are when we are creating the model, right? 
So why are we specifying the uh, the none and comma one uh, value? I, 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 uh, I really the none and comma values just means that our 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 particular our particular data has this particular shape. That's that's basically what this means. Um, there's nothing crazy about okay. it and all that. That just means our data has this particular shape. Just none, like one axis and one particular dimension has nothing, and then we have data on the other dimension. That's what this input shape means. And if if we sort of had a data that had two dimensions, um, we can sort of do three and then that particular dimension. That's basically what this is, what this does, the input shape. It just specifies how the input will look like or what type of data our particular layer here, the LSTM layer, is going to get. So this, this, this has nothing to do with the model. This just has to do with the shape of your data. Uh, yeah, so does that answer your question? Milky, um, De Deborah, I'm going to get you. Let's um, finish with Milky first. Did that answer your question, Milky? No, I mean, okay. Um, so Deborah, you can unmute yourself and ask your question as we wait on Milky. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Okay, uh, I was wondering, uh, do we, when we specify the window size, is that a mm -hmm. hyperparameter that we tune, or is there a way to make the optimum window size? Uh, it, it's uh, it, okay. It it will depend on your data. It will depend on the data that you have and what size you want the training set and the test set to be. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I can even choose twenty four. I mean. I chose 48. Yeah, I chose 48 and you can choose 24. So it's just some some value that you will pick depending on the data that you have. Okay. Um so uh, does it have an effect on the uh, output? For example, uh, by varying the window size, can we get better results? Not really. Okay. It it, it depends and Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But if if you choose if you choose a window that is too long, and you know this is time series data, and the thing with time series data is things that are happening a couple of times before and a couple of months before will tend to influence um, the particular event that is going on right now. Let's say for for example, there are elections going on or the COVID period. If the events that happened in that particular window the COVID window, um, prices and house sales will definitely drop based on that window period or that one year or two years windows period. So if you choose a large enough window or some large window, this sort of de defeats the purpose where you'll get maybe some events that don't really influence the sales that is happening today. And if you choose a small, a small window, then it might miss something that might have influenced the particular price in this particular sense. So you just have to sort of get a sense of what is too much and what is too less. Okay, so, yeah. thank you. Um, is Milky back? Okay, so I think the yeah, other mic. Oh, okay, um, did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. No, cool, no problem. Um, I think my call, the other one, what was he? Um, I think he had asked the question and then he sort of didn't raise his hand. Is it this, this my call, my call Darko? If, if you had a question, just um, write it in chat. No, my hands are not up, my hands are down. I, my no. issue was when you were pointing something. Ah, okay, cool, cool, no problem. And so let's get back here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The epochs you see, we framed that, and that took so that took about one seventy five milliseconds, multiplied by two hundred. I don't know. I don't know what that is. Um, really sure. So yeah, for the model focus, 
we sort of do the same thing um, that we did on the training set. And we have the model here and the series, and we do the same shift, but this time we won't do the plus one, right? That time we won't do the plus one because we don't need the training column and we don't need the target column. So you just do what you do to the training set, you do to the test set. And yeah, we, we do the same flat and then we prefetch it and then we predict. That's just basically what we did before. And you have the forecast here. And as you can see, if you come to the to this is just a forecast or rather the predicting function. And you can see that once we come to the prediction for our function here, we will include all the values that we had. Um, yeah, you can see this. This means uh, get all the values that we have up to the new axis. Um, the made up one, see, none type, yeah, basically none. The one that you had before and the window size. And that's what this does. The reason why we train with the whole with the whole data, the one that you have from the beginning to the end, is the model to learn a state. And as you can see, I've defined what a state is. State is basically where am I now inside a sequence? Like for is a graph, here we go, right? So for this particular data from here to here, uh, I mean to the end up to here 2021, right? We have to have an initial understanding of where we were of the time series that we have. So if we train the whole model from here to the end here, it's going to learn where we are and we can get the data. It's going to have that continuous state and we get to know where we are in this particular time and in this particular instance. So if we split the data from maybe this is 207 going forth, it is going, it's going to sort of know this is where we want to split it and this is what we've learned so far. And so I think, I hope that makes sense. And yeah, yeah. So we just train the whole and we take now, after we've trained it the whole size, uh, I mean, after we've trained the whole of it, we now take the batch size minus the window size. This sort of give us, gives us last values or where the training set was. And from this particular position to the end, yeah, to the end. And with that now we plot, okay, we do the inverse. We sort of inverse as we did before, you know, we scale down first and then we did the inverse. And then after we inverse, we just sort of plot the results. The X, I mean, the results that we had from our particular model and the valid result, again, it's time. And we can see that our model generally does pretty well. It sort of has captured that upward trend as you go up and it sort of has these dips. Well, the dips has happened, but it has basically learned. And then we can use the RMSE and the ME to sort of indicate the errors that we have. And you can see that it, it generally performs well. It has generally understood a lot of things when it comes to the model, All right? So that's the end of our tutorial with LSTM. And if you have questions, please feel free to ask. And if you don't have them now, please feel free to ask in, in the rocket chat. And I mean, I saw um, you, you, you call the weights. Um, yeah, uh, the weights are what is being updated. Uh, think of it, okay, let me, let me sort of go here. Where, where was the explanation? Uh, can you explain the values for the model creation again? Okay, cool. Um, ah, no, 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 no. This is you don't have to submit this today. Um, this is for Saturday. So yeah, we'll give you time to work on it, and you can also infer, infer like a lot, and utilize the code that we have here. Just uh, play around with a particular model. What was it? Yeah. I just play around with the model and sort of change it to fit your particular data. But you can you can reuse this code. Feel free to reuse this code. That is not, yeah. Uh, so for, for, yeah, you can reuse the code and this submission will be for Saturday. Okay. Uh, so let me answer the weight the weight question first, and I'm going to explain the model creation again. Let's come here. So with the weights, um, we still have this particular function. Well, x, x is the variables. Uh, these are the columns that we have in our data set. 
and this is a bias. This is just uh, a weight or something that is added uh, to sort of minimize how far the model can go and how close the model can go. So these two particular variables, the bias and the weights, are usually updated after the run, the end of a run. Here we go, right? Yeah. So the way back propagation works, Milky, is it's sort of we have this forward direction um, from the inputs here to the output here. That is forward propagation. And now back back propagation is sort of differentiation. I know that's math, and I really don't want to get into the details. And what back propagation means, just whatever values we've learned here, let's go back, updating the values that we've gotten. So if you think, yeah, if you think that this particular, every neuron here, one particular cell here has its own loss function, and that's what we, we defined here. Oh, the, this was for the last neuron, has its own loss function. And depending on the value of this particular output here, it's going to update the weights. And since this value changes, then this one will keep on changing. So the values go on changing, the weights, that's what I mean, go on changing as we go backwards. As we go backwards, we reach this particular end and the weights have been updated, then we do the same forward propagation again. We get from here and then go all the way to the output. And for that particular epoch, the same thing happens. We get here and we get a value, and then we start the whole process back. That is back propagation. I think I should share, I, I will share, I will look for a good resource um, on if you understand it and share it in one of the channels. I mean, in the resource channel, so you can keep out for that. I think I'll tag, I don't know, I'll tag all of you once, once that is done. But I mean, you, you don't really have to know that. That's just additional information. You want to know you can read and understand more about deep learning models on your own at a later date. Uh, can you explain values for the model creation again? So in this particular case, we have and these neurons determines or is determined by how how many how many neurons do you want your layer to have? How how many of these circles do you want your particular layer to have? Input shape here. We have this input shape just specifies how the shape of your data is, how it looks like, um, what 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 are the dimensions of your data. So this we have a noun and one where one particular one particular it's called one particular hmm, in quotes one particular dimension is none and the other one is one. But I don't think you have. Let, let me tell you a secret. I mean. Yeah, because some I'm sure some of this is new to you guys. So you really don't have to worry about defining this for the first time. You don't have to really worry about the input shape because the structure of the data that you get here is sort of going to be similar to this. So, but the input shape is determined by how your data looks like. And for every particular model has a particular shape that, it, that for every, um, I mean, layer, has a particular shape and a particular format that your shape is supposed to be in. That's why you see we had this as a list where we have, yeah, none. One particular axis is none and the other one we have one. So with this particular shape, then the model knows how to interact with the data and how to train your data. Is that what you wanted from me, um, Tony? Um, their creation is in order. What do you mean by the creation is in order, Milky? And I think I'm eating time for the for the for, for the for the Q and A. Uh, Toyin, I'm sorry, I butchered your name. Toyin, did I answer your question? And okay, uh, just unmute yourself, man. Okay. Yes, but uh, you said that the eight is the number of neurons. Does that mean yes. we have like one vertical line of eight neurons or? Eight yes. horizontal lines of that, that's exactly it. One vertical, yeah, one vertical. That's a layer. One vertical, one vertical neuron. Okay. Yeah, just one with eight points and eight sections. Okay, so if you want multiple, like that picture that you showed, mm -hmm. that uh -huh. picture, so you can have eight, six, four, five. You can have like. Yeah. So like if for this creating, one, I can have. 
Yeah. So four, the first the five, first layer will be six, four, and then four, five, okay. six, four, three. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Cool. No problem. And um, Milky, unmute yourself. Um, I'm not really sure what you mean. Uh, I, I think you mean the, the 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 neurons are in order. By in order, you mean like yeah. If 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 you're doing this, let's say if if this was if this was being drawn here on this particular diagram, we'd have the input one with eight here, and then one with four, and then now one for the output. So I'm sure is that what you mean, Milky, or am I wrong? Yes, yeah. So in order, that's that's basically it. Yeah, you depend with how you want. Ah, okay, cool, no problem. Yeah, you define them on how you want them to be like. That's a lot. Cool. Um, so I'm assuming no more questions. And Abubakar, are you here? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, so should you just jump in into the Q and A or? And do you have any other questions pertaining to the project, the planning related, machine learning related? Yes. We can go ahead for I think the next 10, 20 minutes. No, okay, cool, cool. So I mean, uh, I haven't had my lunch yet, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm willing to go on if you guys have questions. So yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. And regarding anything this time, or <laughs> uh, but this week's challenge, and if you have including what we've covered today, so uh, go on and raise your hand or type it out in the chat box. Abubakar and I will try to answer your questions. I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, Lusa, eh, Jerusalem. I hope I said it nice. Ah, OK, thank you, <laughs> uh, Hafton. Um, well, what was your question again? Uh, okay, okay, can I proceed? Yeah, yeah, you can proceed. Okay, my question was, uh, if you have any reference regarding understanding the data more efficiently, because it's taking me time to understand the data, so if there are any steps or any methods or mechanisms I can use to understand data. Uh, what do you mean by understanding the data? Do you mean maybe in a plotting sense or in a description sense? In visualizing, for example, uh, if I have to just work this time, I have to understand the data. Uh, uh, Baka, do you want to take that one? Or uh, there, there, is, there, is, there are, are some resources I, you can use. I don't know if... I didn't get it. Let me see them. If you have a resource that you can sort of help and yeah, so we have this. Um, you can try and open this and help her understand visualizing the data. In... Okay, you mean interpreting the data? Yes, so this is not a link. Like when you plot, like interpreting yeah, the results. How to like plot the, the plots in a certain way that will, okay, let me copy this, that will sort of give her insights and more understanding of what the data entails and what it is. I think this was a good one, was it? Yeah, although um, we we also have um, the self-learning content on um, GitHub. I yeah, gave the link and then sent to the group. You can check that out as a uh, data understanding proposition yeah. where it explains how you can go about uh, plotting data. And and you can go through some of the resources that people have shared here. I mean, yeah, you can find out. So as, as a heartbeat, I'd like to Okay, thank you. And even if you don't go through all of them, you can sort of come and um, what it's called, like pick the ones that you want or the ones that you think have have value and you can get them into them. You see, like we have a particular visualization here. I don't even know what it means. Um, okay, so this is this person is using MATLAB. And it's only one particular plot, okay. So this is a bad example, <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, let me sort of give you a hint. Um, this this particular this particular challenge that you have here was was used in was was a Kaggle competition. 
um, with with the uh, Rossman stores. So you know, go and Google the particular the particular challenge. The data was Rossman, right? I think. Um, we have also included the links to actually you can get to the um, notebook. Yeah, 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 yeah. Created for that competition. So, so. so here you can check this and because i've given you this particular hint um i don't expect you to go there and and copy the code don't copy the code if you if you copy the code you're doing yourself a disservice i think learning is one of the best things that you can do for yourself you sort of look what is being done there and try and understand the code that has been written there and from that understanding you can sort of create and maybe mash up change the code a little bit and add things add aspects of your own inside there and remove some things that you don't think uh, are necessarily necessary try and understand the data and you'll you, you'll have good to better understanding as you go on i mean you want to be job ready in a couple of months and understanding and building that in intuition is even more important for you and will be more valuable for you you see the rosman store sales and you have different um you have this deep running deep deep neural network to focus sales that yeah you can just go through them and see the techniques that these people have used and i think you can you can you okay hotness so you you can filter them by maybe most outboards that's what you want and in far and learn from them yeah, like this one uh, this is a profit one so yeah Okay. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Um, for for Toyin, will adding more neurons increase the accuracy of the model? That also depends. Uh, you can add. You can add. What's it called? You can add neurons and increase complexity, and the the value accuracy that you're getting, the ones that we had here at the end. Mm, yeah. What was it? If the determine what particular neurons and how many layers you use. The number of neurons and the numbers of layers are just a hyperparameter that you can tune. And the performance of, of your model will largely depend on, on what you want and even the accuracy that you want. There's a point where adding more, more layers and more neurons will be too computationally expensive where it's it's costing too much money but your model isn't improving and in that particular sense then what's the point of adding more neurons and sometimes even you don't have to create a large model at once uh, you can sort of create a small model and sort of update the model as you go on and we have other architectures that have sort of done the same thing through and through um we have like for was it vga 16 i think let's see if that's a thing, or maybe I'm saying my own things. See, VG, yeah, VG16 network. Um, this this is sort of uh, a convolution, network. and this one has a certain architecture. You can sort of borrow them from this and build an architecture every single time, specifying the number of and the number of variables that you have. You can come and bo borrow an architecture that has already been proved to be good at something and sort of more fit to fit your particular challenge. So I think I've answered your question, right, Toyin? As a technique of using transfer learning. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Transfer run, learning happens when you borrow the weights. Uh, like if, I don't know, if if you had a model like this, um, where uh, like the VGA here, and somebody has trained it on a particular challenge, you can get those weights. Um, I think here yeah, Keras has, I mean, even TensorFlow. TensorFlow, yeah, um, save weights, right? Save weights, yeah. So yeah, save weights. Now this is going to come here. Yeah. What is it? This particular W that you have here. If we save this, that means again from the beginning, it's going to have weights that are almost close to the challenge. So the training itself will be easier and it's going to be more computationally expensive. 
that's what he mentioned as transfer learning. But for the architecture, you just borrow the code. And the code, the model must have not been trained. You just borrow that particular structure that we have and put it in your code. OK, any more questions? Uh, are in the values we got for MAE and RS, RSM. You, you mean the ones that you have here? <laughs> These ones. I'm thinking those are the ones you mean. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is <laughs> this is this is this is a, a class tutorial. Just wanted to teach you how the intuition behind the model. But if I wanted to make it, thought it would be good when they are low. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the the lower they are, the better. That's basically the general the generalization. But uh, as you can see, this is data across how many years? Uh, from 20, 2013 to 2021, that's eight years. Um, eight times 12, that's 96 data points. And I think an error of generally 500 behind all of them. But yeah, it's, it might be too big, but you can do some tuning and model hyperparameter, hyperparameter tuning. You can add more layers. You can even train it for longer because if, if I probably did, uh, but it might, it might overfit because the error is tending towards zero point something. So this is really significantly a small error. But yeah, you can add more neurons and more layers and train, train, it, train it for longer, decrease the window size to get um, the, the general, or, or to improve the general accuracy of your model. This is a model built for class purposes. So it wasn't really focusing on how good the model is. Mm, so any more questions? No problem. Um, so I'm guessing no more questions. Um, if <laughs> okay, I will make the same joke I made last time. Okay, maybe you, maybe you somewhere. Can I miss yourself? Sorry for late question, but no my question is, uh, it's out of deep learning. It's mm -hmm. for today's assignment. Uh, it asks us to give ML flow screenshots, mm -hmm. but uh, I think for today the only task is the exploratory data analysis. Yes, um, Abuaka. Yeah. So how are we going to do ML flow for uh, the EDA part? It says ML flow for the model and things like that. ML flow for the model, and then we ask you to do ML for EDA as well? Yes, but we didn't uh, start doing the model. How are we going to do ML flow for that? I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it like you're asking in terms of what you're supposed to submit for the intern? Yeah. Yeah. For the interim submission, it asks us to submit ML flow for the models. It says. Okay, and then you have not gotten to that point yet. Eh? Yeah, we were. We, uh, me personally, I'm doing task one part. That's why. Okay. So, um, should we do the model part also for today? We we were thinking that you would have start some parts of the model because. The other task for the deployment is a, is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit it's required to do a lot of work as well. So you were thinking you uh, complete the EDA for Monday, Tuesday, and you focus on the modeling for today and be able to like submit something. And the main idea is that you have already set up the ML flow thing on your uh, machine. So all you have to do is just, you know, get the clean data and then you throw it in, you train, and then you have the ML flow model. So you're not supposed to be, uh, Difficult, so to say. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, Nathaniel, Nathana, Nathaniel. Yeah, Nathaniel, okay. So, uh, Nathaniel, okay. Yeah, I opened the Google Classroom for the assignment and mm -hmm. uh, it only shows uh, to submit the slides and not the DVC or ML flow on the Google Classroom submission. Okay. Um. 
Yeah. But the, the um, schedule for the um, NLP submission will go up, I think, that minute from now. So you will see it as well. Oh, so we will submit the ML flow screenshot today, you, you are mentioning? Yes. Hmm. You also submit the um, completion for the ML flow for the final um, submission as well. So. Okay. All right. So, any, any more other questions, questions uh, pertaining to um, understanding the data of what you are supposed to do with the stuff like that? All right. So, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out on Rocket Chat. And yeah, um, be, be more engaged and feel free to ask anything. If you encounter a problem, we're here to help you guys and we're here to help you understand. Um, so with that, I think that's the end of our session. And I hope you all have a lovely evening and have fun working. Cool. Bye. Cheers, guys. Thank you as well, Deborah.